we are here reflecting on um, verses 26 through 29 from the Tao Te Ching. Um, looking at verse 26. The heavy is the root of the light, the unmoved, the source of all movement. Interesting one, right? Um, something else that you might put here is um, silence is the source of sound. But this is a theme that we'll see, and we saw right at the beginning, when darkness within darkness, that's the key to all understanding. So we, we hear this paradox that um, light actually comes, is born from dark. And then this, this bit at the end of 26, it's a short one. Um, Thus the master travels all day without leaving home. What is that traveling? That's meditation. That's looking inward, um, realizing that whatever it is we want to study out here, that macrocosm um, exists within our own microcosm. However splendid the views, she stays serenely in herself. Great. And um, 27, this is, this, is a, this is a great one. And some of you actually mentioned in your comments that this is something that stood out for you this week. Um, so a good traveler has no fixed plans and is an intent on arriving. A good artist lets his intuition lead him. A good scientist has freed himself of concepts and his mind keeps his mind open to what is. So, so the, the good traveler, artist, and scientists have this certain quality of, a, of an open-mindedness, an ability to be a kind of conduit for guidance to come through, for intuition to come through, for reality to present itself. Um, and of course, how do we, how do I approach it when I'm about to travel or <laughs> try to make some art or, or try to make a new discovery? I often try to be very controlling about the situation. Um, <clears throat> thus the master is available to all people and doesn't reject anyone. He's ready to use all situations and doesn't waste anything. This is called embodying the light. Here's a theme that we see again and again. Um, being judgmental about other people is, is something the master doesn't do. <laughs> it is a sign of immaturity. It's a sign of lack of wisdom. If you can look around and see anything in this incredible place we live in, you know, if you can see, if you can look around and see anything that you deem to be not good enough, um, you're missing, you're missing it. You're unable to see the Tao in them, in that. And this is a great thing to remember, right? When we're feeling um, morally superior or we encounter someone who is immature and acting acting that way, you know? In order for me to sit here and be the good man, right? Um, I have to have I have to have bad men to teach or bad people, people who are less mature to um to give me that sense of differentiation. Again, we see this theme again and again that anytime you have two pairs of opposites, you're caught in duality, you're caught in, in the conscious mind, you're caught in a place that can't recognize the real truth. And so anytime you have opposites like good and bad, um, you, you need to investigate more deeply and see the ways in which they're actually, they create each other. Um, and everybody needs a job, right? My meditation teacher says, you know, if I do my job really well, I'll run myself out of a job. Everyone will become enlightened and then I, and I won't have a job anymore. And that's okay with me, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and I love this also, like, no matter how intelligent you are, you'll get lost. And I know I'm definitely someone who my intelligence is, has been an obstacle for me at times. It has been something that keeps me stuck in the conscious mind um, and and creates a prison for me when I think that my being so intelligent is how I'm going to get out of this. There are more important things than intelligence for the master. Right? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so John Samuel, let me know if that felt satisfying to you because um, you had specifically asked about that part, about the good man, but a bad man's teacher. What is a bad man, but a good man's job? Let me know. Yeah, okay, and then you asked another great question. Let me go through these and I'm gonna loop back around to that. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, where are we? Okay, 28. 28. Know the male, yet keep to the female. This is this is similar to the to 26. Um, heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved is the is the root of movement. Okay. Receive the world in your arms. So the female is considered. So yin and yang, the yin and yang symbol, the symbol of the Tao, these two very basic concepts of yin and yang, the idea being duality that actually makes one whole, that isn't separate, but that belongs together. Um, and the yin element is considered, and, and of course, I think I think we're at this. Where you guys are at the point where you get this, but it doesn't mean that all women are yin, like like gender. Uh, it, it, yeah, it certainly relates to gender and gender stereotypes, etc. But everyone contains the masculine and the feminine, right? So the yin is the aspect of reality that is receptive. So he's saying, <clears throat> keep to the female, identify as the female, receive the world in your arms. If you receive the world, the Tao will never leave you and you will be like a little child. Um, know the white, yet keep to the black. Be a pattern for the world. If you are a pattern for the world, the Tao will be strong inside you and there will be nothing you can't do. So again, the white, the color white is associated with young. And the color black is associated with the yin. Be a pattern for the world. Um, hang on one second. Hang on one second. Sorry to fix the recording that I'm doing. Um, Um, so, so, so this, this is really interesting. Be a pattern for the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the Tao will be strong inside you. So, so we're starting to gather this sense of the master being, and we've already, you know, it's already talked about that the master is fluid or the master is, um, well, okay, yeah, let's just keep going with this. But the, again, we're painting this, this sense of what the master is. And the master is the master of the yin and identifies with the yin. Um, know the personal, but keep yet keep to the impersonal. And uh, if you accept the world, the Tao will be luminous inside you and you will return to your primal self. So we know... We we know what is um, what is personal, right? I know I know Aaron. I know things that are specific, but I am constantly returning to the impersonal, returning to the subtle, returning to what it is that we all share. The world is formed from the void, like utensils from a block of wood. The master knows the utensils, yet keeps to the block. Thus, she can use all things. Um, and, and Pamela mentioned this part as being something that really stuck out to her this week. But um, here again, we have the void, we have the emptiness, we have the nothing, we have the darkness, we have this yin um, being primary. 
And if you go back to some of the earliest verses, um, this this part reminds me of of some of the verses where he talks about emptiness. Uh, the remember the one where the it's the that's this the unmoving center of the wagon wheel that's the most important part. Um, he talks about the inside, the empty inside of the vessel is actually what we use, that, 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 that the emptiness is really what we're working with. And so the master is more interested in the emptiness and the void than the manifestations, than the stuff. And um, this, this also reminds me a bit of, um, of in, uh, in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, the um, the concept of being in the world but not of it, being totally at peace and comfortable in this material realm, but recognizing all the time that that what we have always been and are more originally like this is just a little blip, this personality, this manifestation. But we recognize that what we really are and what we really come from and what everything comes from is this is spirit in a way, or emptiness, or the void, the Tao. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about this last verse, and then I'm going to answer John Samuel's question. <clears throat> All right. So the verse that we read today, do you want to improve the world? I don't think it can be done. The world is sacred, it can't be improved. So I, I wanna talk about just that part. This, this is one of those verses that I just, I do, I come back to a lot, I teach from a lot. I remember these lines often because I often get myself into a place of suffering because I'm trying to fix something or I'm really frustrated that someone else isn't doing a good enough job with something or something that I, I deem is broken, right? Um, <clears throat> and this idea, the world is sacred. It can't be improved. It's very, is a very helpful reminder in those moments for me. Now, this part, this is something that I've come back to again and again. Um, you know, he says, if you tamper it, you'll ruin it. But this line, this line, if you treat it like an object, you'll lose it. Right. That is that is something that I've thought about so, so much. <laughs> um, the idea that objectifying anything, any one. Is the opposite of what we're trying to do here as spiritual people. It is the opposite of what the master does. Um, I have realized in my own life that that's where I draw my boundaries. Um, and also it's where I just recognize, I recognize that anyone who is objectifying me, anyone who is making me as a character in their own mind story more important than what I actually am and how I actually show up, that is somebody who I'm not going to be able to fully trust. And, and, and the thing is, we all do this all day long. Anytime you want to use something, it's an object. Right. So if we're trying to get something out of someone or trying to manipulate them, trying to um, trying to make them different than they are. All of that is is doing exactly what this verse is saying, you know, treat something like an object, you'll lose it. Then this part, oh my gosh, I return to this constantly. And I was really sitting with this in our meditation. There is a time for being ahead, a time for being behind, a time for being in motion, a time for being at rest, for being vigorous, for being exhausted, for being safe. There's a time for being in danger. All of these things he, he, he lists here are naturally occurring things. Again, he's playing with pairs of opposites. He's asking us to look at this list and go, do I value half of this list more than the other? Yeah. If I really look at my life, I tend to value, overly value being ahead, being in motion, being vigorous, and being safe. But we have 
and we have danger sensors for a reason. Those are really important and valuable. We get exhausted. We that's that is that's wisdom, right? That is the the, the Tao endowed us for a rest. Um, something else that you might add to this list: a pair of opposites that we talk a lot about in yoga is pain and pleasure. There's a time to be in pain. And there's a time for pleasure. If you want it to all be pleasure and motion and vigor and safety, good luck. Good luck, right? Um, he's saying that's not the way of the master because here's the end of our verses for today. The master sees things as they are without trying to control them. Trying to control something belies that we have objectified it already. We have already said yeah, this this world that the Tao made or that God made or whatever you want to say, right? This this universe is is okay, but I think I've got a better I've got some better ideas. I'm gonna I'm gonna spruce things up around here. I'm gonna do a better job than the Tao, right? Immediately what you're doing is you're saying, I don't what you're actually what a master will see when someone's doing that is, oh honey, right? You don't you don't completely understand what you're seeing. And you so therefore you can't totally value what you're seeing and you have devalued it and made it into an object essentially in your own mind. And you're not allowed, you're not in that yin place where you can receive what you're really experiencing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm gonna finally turn to um, John Samuels is like Ecclesiastes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so John Samuel asked this great question. How do we make peace with our needs and desires according to the Tao? Um, if this is a question of interest for you, keep exploring it and, and keep looking through the verses so far and keep, keep your eye out in the verses that are to come that you keep your eye out for, for answers to this question or for, or for indication of what you think that the teaching is. I'll tell you what my understanding is. Um, we make peace with our needs and desires according to the Tao because or by accepting our own needs and desires as also expressions of the Tao, right? Everything that we see, everything that we encounter. So like today's meditation, there's a time for being ahead. There's a time for being behind. I was kind of feeling that as I, oh, and I forgot, did I forget something here? Uh, I did kind of forget. I forgot to kind of close up the very last bit of that, that verse. Anyway, that I love so much. But anyway, <laughs> when I'm sitting and meditating, I, I could sit here and go, oh, there's, this is the time for inhale. This is the time for expansion. Oh, this is the time for exhale, contraction and letting go. Oh, this is the time for receiving, right? That like you're just sitting there and you're realizing that everything is coming and going. Um, This last line that I, I come back to again and again, and there's similar lines that we've seen. She lets, she lets everything go its own way and she resides at the center of the circle. So again, that's my meditation practice. I often even visualize a, a center, a very a center of a circle. And then I feel that that center is in the very center of my physical somatic experience. Okay, back to your question. So your needs and desires are also things that that, that, that happen, that, that come through. There is a time for desire, right? There's a time for need. There's, um, and what we want, what we what we come to learn how to see is that everything here, outside, inside, we treat with this same non-attached reverence. We we treat with this sense of, um, oh, you know. I, I think it's the Rumi poem. You know, this body is a is a guest house, and every guest is a is a sacred guest sent from beyond um so every feeling that you have and getting to getting to to know our inner world i know for me i didn't even really 
I'm still learning about my own needs and desires. I often misinterpreted what I felt and what I needed. I often couldn't sit at the center of the circle long enough to understand what my needs and desires really were. But if you follow this logic all the way and you apply it, and if you apply it, you know, with equanimity to all the different spaces of your life, lo and behold, um, you will discover that those needs and desires are also gifts from the Tao. They also all come with their own sacred wisdom that is just perfectly on time. Um, they are how we get guided, right? And um, I'm just going to wrap this up now because now our sessions are getting longer, right? <laughs> and um, we spent a nice amount of time here together and, and I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, perfect, 20 minutes. So, but yeah, just wrapping it up there, there was a verse somewhat recently that, you know, he, he says, trust your natural responses and everything will fall into place. Everything's going to work out great. Your job is, is not to control anything or stop anything or change anything. It's to accept it all and to become one of those beings through which the Tao can flow. Um, to become one of those beings who is so aligned with the Tao that, that everything inside you and everything around you um, is able to fall back into its its true nature. Its true nature, which which is sacred and holy and perfect, just as it is. All right. So that is um, that is our session for today. Thank you all for joining me. Please, anybody who's watching or listening, we would love to hear about your thoughts in the comments. And everybody else who's on the line, thank you so much for being here. Everybody have a great, great day.